Hello, and thank you so much for joining us today for the webinar Buccal Play Preservation. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Dr. Alfonso Cayazzo, whose aim during this presentation will be to discuss about a new technique to improve aesthetic results in single implant placement. Dr. Alfonso Cayazzo was awarded his dental degree at the University of Naples, Italy in 1991. He is visiting assistant professor of oral and maxillofacial surgery in the Henry M. Goldman School of Dental Medicine, Boston University. He is a member of the American Association of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery and also president-elect of the Italian Society of Oral Surgery and Implant Dentistry. Dr. Cayazzo is certified in Wilcodontics. He is founding member of the European Society of Dental and Craniofacial Stem Cells and author of several articles in international journals. His office is located in Salerno, Italy, and his practice is limited to oral surgery and implant dentistry. We would like to thank Dr. Cayazzo for being with us today and Botis for making this lecture possible. Please take note of any questions and comments you have during the lecture as they will be addressed by Dr. Cayazzo at the end of the presentation. Without any further delay, please help me welcome the expert himself, Dr. Cayazzo. Hello everybody, thanks for uh, the introduction. I want to thank everybody to take some time off from their uh, busy practices to listen to this webinar in which I will uh, present, as the introduction said, a new technique uh, to improve the aesthetic results in the single implant placement. I want to thank Bodis to give me the opportunity to share my thoughts and my findings of my careers in um, on, uh, on the aesthetic uh, areas. By the end of this webinar, I would like for you to have another tool in your drawer tomorrow in a daily practice, in an everyday practice, to use when you're facing uh, an, ant an anterior implant, an, an, an implant in the anterior maxilla in an aesthetic area. Because my thought is a little bit different than probably what you had, or what you had thought so far in a single implant placement in the aesthetic area. So I will go through the uh, current literature uh, or the aesthetic areas, and then I'll uh, bring up my idea and this new technique to share with you. Before starting with the uh, the real topic, I just want to go back and talk about the most common surgical procedure we probably perform in our office. Either if you are a general practitioner or a surgeon, periodontist, oral surgeon, probably tooth extraction is the most common surgical procedure we perform in our office. But what do we know about the tooth extraction? What do we know about the socket, the healing of the socket? The socket has been studied very well and uh, since in the late 50s. And so we know a lot about the healing. And there are, I think, two main uh, points that have to be brought up. One is that the extraction socket, it's a self-healing process. So if we don't take any action into the socket, we'll have a complete healing after some time. But the socket will heal by itself. The other thing we know, looking at the literature, is that in the socket, during the process of the self-healing, we might get some resorption. So for the self-healing process, we don't need to take any action. Because if we leave the socket heal by itself, we will have, after a few months, a complete healed bone that looks like a native bone. But we might get some resorption during this healing time. Let's look at the... Um, socket healing in the literature. We know that the heals in few weeks, basically, 
Actually, the healing will start from the apex of the socket and go into the crest. And in six weeks, all the alveolus will be filled by osteoid tissue. So six weeks is the time we have to keep in mind when we do implant surgery. Why six weeks? Because six weeks we will have osteoid tissue. The alveolus is full of osteoid tissue. That's why the immediate delay implants are placed at six weeks, because we will have a socket full of osteoid tissue. Then the osteoid tissue becomes bone over weeks, over months, and you have osteogenic activity that goes up to six months. At six months, you will have a stable socket. You will have all bone. And this is the time we used to wait before placing the, uh, the implants in the old days. You know, from the Brandemark protocol, we used to wait four to six months before placing the implant after extracting a tooth. But I think, I bet nobody out there wait that long anymore. But if we know that the socket heals by itself, there is a price we have to pay to my mother nature. And the price is called resorption. The resorption has been pointed out in many studies in the literature. You know, probably the most famous uh, articles are written by the Cardaropolis group, by the Brazilian group, the Araujo group, the Swedish group, the Lindes group, and all these uh, uh, resorption patterns are summarized in this nice article by Chan, published in 2004 in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. As you see here, you get resorption up to six months, so you can get horizontal and vertical. So now we know that we do get some resorption. I would like to say we might get resorption. Because sometimes it's not predictable, and I'll show you later. But more than knowing that, you know, we do get resorption horizontally and vertically, I want to point out this article published in the Clinical Oral Implant Research in 2014 by Farmer and Darby. And they were taking 20 aesthetic uh, uh, extraction sites in the aesthetic area. And they were considering the rich dimensional changes following uh, tooth extraction. And they were measuring the changes, the dimensional changes, six, eight weeks post extraction. An important thing they noticed is that 42% of the sockets lost four millimeter or more of buccal plate. That's a huge amount. And a large number, 42% of the sockets. But even more important is that they noticed that 100% of the cases required GBR. Minor Major, doesn't matter, membrane, non-membrane, doesn't matter what kind of GBR they required, but 100% of the sites required GBR. Six, eight weeks after the extraction. That's just two months after the extraction. Basically, when we usually go in and place the implant, the immediate delayed implant, when the socket is all full of osteoid tissue. And this is what I see all the time. I'm sure you do see this all the time too. If you take out a tooth and you wait for four months to have a stable socket, you go from a convexity here to a concavity. See where the pointer is. Okay, pointer doesn't work. Oh no, here it is, I'm sorry. Okay, you go from a convexity here to a concavity, because you're getting the resorption we talked about. So we know that if we wait, we will need some kind of uh, regenerative procedure. 
And, you know, we do this all the time, as I said, we open up the flap, we see some resorption, we place the implant, we do a classical GBR, a GBR with the autogenous probably bone on the implant surface, and then some xenograft to maintain the contour in the long term, and then a collagen membrane holding the graft there. And we definitely regain the convexity there. We regain the root eminence appearance. We know this is pretty predictable. It's no brain procedure. Easy and predictable. And this is the clinical result. This is even with the temporary. Look how natural the uh, tooth looks. And we are stable because we're placing some uh, non-resorbable material holding the structure holding the architecture of the socket and the alveolus mimic the root eminence. 15 years later, I'm still stable with soft tissues and with hard tissues. But you waited four months after the extraction, then you had to perform a GBR, and then you have to wait another four to six months before the xenograft becomes bone. So this procedure or this implant to be delivered completely and in a final aspect takes a year or more. This is way too long for a modern practice. We can speed up the procedure and wait only six weeks and talking about the immediate delayed placement and the immediate delayed placement is the one we perform more, most commonly, usually. That's what we do most of the time with implants. We take out the tooth, we wait six weeks. But again, we know from the literature and we know from the clinical cases, I'm sure you see this in your practice. Six weeks after the extraction, you don't see the root eminence appearance anymore. It looks completely unnatural, flat or even concave. And if I do a wax up, I see what kind of disaster I can face if I don't do any action there. So I definitely need to do some action, probably a minor action, but still I need to gain some volume here. Opening up, placing the implant, taking an impression to have a temporary at the second stage, but stage two, but see here, minor GBR, just some uh, autogenous bone taken from the site, preparation site, some connected tissue from the palatal aspect of the flap. Again, easy, but still it's another procedure, it's another flap, some connected tissue, you need some more stuff, so you need to take some action. And we were lucky we lost just a few millimeters. We didn't lose that much in this case, but sometimes we lose more. And again, we reach stability, I agree. Three years, you know, radiographically and clinically, we're stable. We got a nice contour, nice peaks of bone, we're stable, but again, we had to perform another surgery and we waited only six weeks. So, resorption, we need some action. There is a need for action out there. So we need to think about something to do in order to counteract the uh, resorption of the ridge. What kind of actions we have? The first one we were, you know, we thought about was the immediate placement. Back in the 90s, we were thinking that, you know, by placing the implant, we will preserve the architecture of the socket. And this famous study from Lazzara, it's dated 1989. They were placing implants in immediate 
uh, immediately after extraction. And they were thinking that they will save the architecture. But we know from the more recent literature, articles by Araujo in 2005, Botticelli 2004, that the architecture of the socket won't be maintained but by placing the implant in the extraction socket. So this is an action we don't we can take, or this is an action that won't save us from resorption. And this image, this slide is taken from the Araujo study in 2006. It was placing the implant right at the extraction time. And see, the buccal plate is still there. Four weeks later, you lo start losing it. Twelve weeks later, you lose even more. This in the anterior maxilla will be, we will be a disaster. You might lose the soft tissue. You might end up with uh, some uh, showing of the abutment. So you don't want a place uh, so unsafe. In your practice, I'm sure you want to be safe. You want to perform procedures that are predictable in the long term. This is not predictable. You know, I would back in the 90s, in the, 90, in the early uh, 2000, in the late uh, 90s, that's where we, we were doing it. Taking down the tooth, placing an implant. Nice result at the beginning and in the long term. I was seeing this concavity all the time. So this is not the, uh, the right way to do it. This is not the right action to take to counteract the resorption. And we know that in order to be stable, we need some hard and soft tissue. We need two millimeters of hard tissue and two millimeters of soft tissue. So this is a nice start. You know, when you're looking at things, now that we have uh, CBCT in our... Uh, dental clinics, it's even easier because we can measure easier the amount of uh, heart tissue of buccal plate. But more than this, that you know, you need two millimeters. The thing you want to know is how many times on how many teeth I find two millimeter of buccal, two millimeters of buccal plate. I think whoever perform surgeries in the anterior maxilla post-extraction cases should read this article by the Yuba group. This is a 2010 article. And in this article, this group was studying 93 extraction sites, measuring the buccal plate. And the most important thing is that the mean width of the buccal plate K9, from K9 to K9 was 0.8 millimeter. We far, far, far away from those two millimeters that we two millimeters that we need for stability. But what I pointed out, the most important thing is that 87% of the cases of the anterior cases were less than one millimeter. Less than one millimeter. And guess what? Only three percent of the cases have a two millimeter had a two millimeter two millimeters of buccal plate. That means that you're going to perform a surgery, a procedure, doing an implant placement, and you know that you're going to be successful only in 3% of the cases that you're treating. I bet nobody will do a case like this. By reading this article, you stop doing immediate placement. Because only 3% of your cases will be stable. This is insane. This is not medicine. Then, if the immediate placement can help us with the resorption, there must be another ac uh, action we can take. And the other action is called socket preservation. I want to show you some... Uh, Milestones, two articles that are milestones, they are considered milestones in the ridge preservation technique. One is the one for Carmagnola, and here you're seeing that in the grafted sites, 
you see some connective tissue into the alveolus and some xenografts still into the alveolus. So you don't get 100% bone. You think this is a good tissue to insert an implant in? I'm not sure. And the other one, the other milestone is the, the article by, by uh, Yasella. And this is, this is supposed to be one of the articles supporting the ridge preservation. I know this is a kind of a old article, but it's a milestone. Is it quoted in every article you read about the ridge preservation? And the conclusion is that even in the ridge preservation group, there is a loss of buccal plate, average of 1.2 millimeters. That's a lot. That's way too much. So even if you preserve, if you do some kind of ridge preservation, socket preservation, you lose some bone. Let's look at the uh, newest, uh, more recent uh, literature. I put up some systematic review and some meta-analysis. And basically, what you see in this uh, systematic review and meta-analysis is that this is from October 2014. And in this one, from the Journal of Dental Research, is a certain degree of ridge volume loss should be expected, even if alveolus ridge preservation is applied. I agree, there is tons of literature out there. You might read this and the other and did that, but I'm not bringing, bringing up some case reports or study, 10 cases or whatever. I'm bringing up systematic review and meta-analysis. So this one from October 2014 doesn't support the ridge preservation. The other one from July 2014, another meta-analysis, this resorption of the alveolar ridge cannot be totally stopped by ridge preservation. So we're doing something that doesn't help us that much. And we do that all the time in our offices. You know, we do socket preservation, socket preservation. Any meeting you go to, there is a section on socket preservation. And if you look at the literature, the systemic review, the recent systemic reviews, you notice that there is no support. It doesn't help us to maintain the, the architecture of the socket. This one from September 2015 says that there is limited evidence to support the clinical benefit of ARP. So why you want to do a, a procedure that does little evidence? It's not helping. And even if it does help, we have to wait a minimum healing period of 12 weeks. 12 weeks is three months. So we do something and we slow down our treatment plan we're slowing down the deliver of the final restoration. We're slowing down the healing, basically. And then we do perform some procedure like socket preservation, trying to counteract something that we don't know if, when, and how much happens. I'm showing you in this case to tell you that the resorption is unpredictable. You can tell, oh, this patient will lose four millimeters for sure, or everybody does lose four millimeters after extraction. You can predict, absolutely not. Look at this case, eight weeks post-op, there is no dimensional changes, none, zero. I haven't lost any width, I haven't lost any height. But, if I take a look at the clinical scenario, I see a concavity there. So there must, is, there must th be something else to take into consideration, to be taken into consideration. We're losing width, we're losing the contour, even if we're not losing the, if we're not losing the buccal plate. This is the case I showed you before in the CBCT. So we're losing something else. We're losing soft tissue, we're losing periodontal fibers. So we're doing something into the socket that will help because the fight we'll be losing the fiber the fibers anyway. And we know from the literature that the thin biotype will lead to more resorption. So let's look at what we've seen so far, the key points we discussed so far. We know that the uh, resorption is influenced by the biotype, as we've seen in the last 
in the previous slide that the resorption is unpredictable. We don't know when, how much, and if we get any. It might benefit from ARP, but I showed you that there is small support, small evidence that it helps. And of course, ARP interferes with the bond formation into the socket. That socket is a self-feeling process, of a self-feeling potential, will heal by itself. And even if you do some regenerative, some socket preservation procedure, you have to wait at least three months to get some benefit. Hmm. So let's, you know, after looking at all these, something came up to my mind. I said, I need to take advantage of the self-healing process of the socket. If that heals and it gives me 100% bone, why I want to do something that I will end up with less bone? I don't want to slow down the healing because I want to be fast in my practice. Uh, safe, predictable, but fast. All the patients come to my practice, and I'm sure they come to your dental clinic, saying, Doctor, how long it will take? When, I, when will I have the final restoration? And of course, I want to minimize the risk of an anesthetic result. So I need something different than what I've seen so far. So if I know that placing something into the socket will slow down the healing process, and I won't have 100% bone, but I have a good material now, I have a good, excellent grafting materials that they will be stable in the long term. So what can I do? I can use the same material in placing outside the buckle, uh, the, uh, the alveolus. I just need to create a small pouch with a very thin periosteal elevator and put in a graft outside. This technique I called buckle plate preservation. You know, with this friend of mine from Rome, we chat all the time, we discuss cases, and uh, we do research together. And one morning we said, hey, probably this could work. This is an idea. Let's start. And we started doing cases and cases and cases. And this is what we were seeing. Basically, we were mimic the root eminence appearance just by placing some small amount of grafting of a xenograft outside the socket, not interfering with the healing of the socket. And the thing we need from our xenograft, from our grafting material, is the long-term volume stability. Because there, I'm not looking for a regenerative procedure itself. I'm just looking to maintain the contour, the root eminence appearance. So we we'll need something stable in the long term. I'm creating probably a, a super connected tissue. I'm not looking for bone, because I'm not placing an implant there, I'm placing the implant into the socket when it heals or whenever I want, but I'm not looking to create bone out there. Even if we have excellent characteristics of, the, uh, of our grafts nowadays, you know, they're osteoconductive, they're like the native bone, they capture blood cells, and you know, and they excellent for regenerative procedures, they have a very nice results. You know, the osteoblasts will attach to the uh, to the graft, but here, the only characteristic I need is that it gives me a long-term stability. Six weeks, I'm going in. I know that in the socket, I have osteoid tissue because I haven't done anything on the so into to the socket. So, by the lit from the literature, I know that in six weeks I have 100% osteoid tissue. I can go in, not interfering. There is no interference with the healing process. I place the implant, I place the temporary if I want, or if I don't want, I don't place the temporary. And this is the final result. We published this in 2010 in the Journal of Oral and Maxillofacial Surgery with Dr. Bugnami. But, hey, this is not much because I'm presenting a new alternative, a case presentation. 
I can stand in, a, in front of a podium, in front of an audience on a podium and saying, hey, this works. I have to be more scientific. So we designed the study with 20 sockets, all four wall intacts, one of the important criteria to select a case for buckle plate preservation is that the socket has to have all the four walls in, uh, intact walls. So we treated 10 patients with the buccal plate preservation technique. 10 were left healed normally. We were taking impression at the extraction time, and we were taking impression at six weeks when we were placing the implant. All the measurements were done on the study cast by a technician. It was blinded to the study. And you see, you can see here, on top, see how much resorption you get. And on the bottom, the ones treated with the buccal plate uh, preservation technique, there is no resorption. Six weeks after, we're placing an implant and it looks like we just took out the tooth. Here you need some action for sure. So I can say that now the action could be buccal plate preservation technique at the extraction time. So when I take out the tooth, I want to put something outside the socket to don't interfere with the self-healing process. So this is the table showing the 10 cases with the buccal plate and the 10 cases without the buccal plate preservation technique. In the one treated by, in the ones treated with the buccal plate preservation technique, all the numbers are positive but one. In the non-buccal plate, all the numbers are negative but two. So definitely you're gaining something. But the conclusions of the studies, of the study, are that the mean gain was 0.85 millimeter and the mean loss was 0.9. We're doubling the amount of bone we're maintaining there with the buccal plate preservation technique. So this is an action you can take in consideration tomorrow. You take out a tooth, you do something, and then you let the socket heal by itself. You don't do anything into the socket. You don't slow down the process. You have bone into the socket, osteoid tissue, no connective tissue at all. We published the study in the International Peri uh, Journal of Periodontics and Restorative Dentistry in uh, 2011. So as a conclusion for the buccal plate done, uh, in the uh, at the extraction time that doesn't interfere with the self-healing potential, doesn't slow down the healing, and it maintains the root eminence appearance. So I answer to the question I asked before. Is there a way? Yes, there is. And this is the way. Definitely this is the way. This is the new tool. And I told you, I'm not looking for a GBR, but you know, when we were at the beginning, we were very curious. We were going and opening up some cases just to see what was going on underneath the periosteum. And sometimes we found real bone, even without the membrane. So this is stable. This will stay there forever. It looks like a root, and there is no root there. But of course, as I told you, all the patients come to our practice always in a rush, you know, their manager, their modeling or whatever. And so is there a way to reduce the treatment time and control the remodeling as well? We know from the literature that the single tooth implant placed early or delayed after tooth extraction show high survival rates. So basically, if we place the implant into the socket right away, we have a high survival rate. This is a 10-year result study. Basically, if you, car, if you do a correct treatment planning, and if you do a nice, a correct case selection, if you're good in selecting your cases, and you're excellent in treatment planning, the systematic review shows that the survival rate of the immediate implant will be the same as the delayed implant. So yes, there is a way to reduce the treatment plan. But can we do something associated with the immediate placement that it will help us to maintain the root eminence appears? Yes, we can. We're doing this ongoing trial with 20 sockets in the anterior maxilla, four, wall in, four intact walls, as I told you. 
We're doing impl implant insertion, a BLT Strauman implant immediately placed into the socket after extraction, plus placing the cerebral in the, uh, the, in the buccal plate preservation mode outside the socket. We're placing, we are placing the temporary at six weeks. And the final four months, we're measuring on a CBCT pre-op and post-op. This is a case from the study. 1.1 unrestorable, fractured, needs to come out. See the contour here. We have this convexity there because we have a root there. We want to keep this to, in order to be successful. And this is the pre op CBCT. We don't have two millimeter here of buccal plate. Look at the red arrow. We don't have two millimeter. We're unstable there. We're sure we're going to get some resorption there. Soft tissue, hard tissue, whatever. We're going to get some resorption. We need to take some action. And the action is called buccal plate preservation, even when we place the implant right after extraction. We're doing the small pouch. You can do the pouch before or after extraction, doesn't really matter. Then taking out the tooth. This is the alveolus, the post-extractive alveolus. Positioning of the implant with the direction pin, just to make sure that we're in the correct position. And then I'm taking the impression once I place the implant in order to have the temporary ready in six weeks. And I won't take the impression with the impression material. Mapping the site to make sure that I'm subcrestal or at least a crest, palatal, you know the rules. I'll show you the, the, the positioning anyway later on. And this is the correct way to place an implant after extraction. You should all familiar with these numbers if you want to be successful in the aesthetic areas. And I'm sure all of you know the article about from Boozer, 2004. He was talking about comfort in danger zone. This is very well written and done. You know, Boozer is a master. And he has told us where you'll be safe and when you'll be unsafe to place an, in, an implant in the aesthetic area. You don't want to lose any bone around. So you have to be precise. Your hands have to be excellent. I'm transferring the implant position into a cast, into a lab cast, with a surgical stent. This is what I do all the time on the anterior maxilla. I always take an impression, even if I don't load the implant right away. I have the temporary ready if I want to insert six weeks later so I don't have to take an impression. And this is the cerebrum placed along the buccal plate and some just at the collar of the implant to keep to hold this soft tissue there. Front of view, you see the graft up here going to the mucosa. And as I told, as I said before, we don't place a membrane there because we don't want to. We're not looking for a regenerative procedure. We're looking for something to hold the shape, the contour, the architecture. And we usually use aesthetic suture, a single stitch, if we're not placing the, um, the temporary right away. We're using nylon here, a 5 0 nylon, 6 0 nylon, just to hold the graft material there, just to hold the clot. You want something holding the clot there. And post-op, see here where the red arrow is? This is the cerebrum outside the socket. Above the buccal plate, on top of the buccal plate. This is xenograft. This is stable in the long term. This will stay, I hope, forever. But for the rest of patient's life, maybe. This is one week. Look at the healing. You still have the root eminence appearance there. You haven't lost any. Almost you gain some. So you can counteract some, uh, counteract some resorption. Six weeks after, look how natural the, the temporary looks. The occlusal view. 
contour is exactly the same as the contralateral side. And we're six weeks under down the road. Final restoration, four months. Look at the natural appearance. Look at the shape, the dome shape, the zenith are equal. The texture, look at the occlusal view. This appearance here that it looks like parmesan cheese up there in the mucosa, you will lose it in one or two years. But you will lose it and you will keep the contour and the shape, the root eminence appearance. This is six months follow up. You still see the uh, grafting material up there. You start losing some, you know, some appearance of the graft up in the mucosa. One year follow up, stable, stable, stable. You haven't lost any root eminence appearance. You still have a convexity. You don't have a concavity. So you definitely can say that this technique works even even if we're placing the implant right away in the socket. So we don't need the implant doesn't help us to maintain the architecture of the socket, but the implant in conjunction with the uh, buccal plate preservation technique is maintaining the contour and the architecture of the socket. But again, you know, we're moving faster and faster and faster and faster and we want to be faster and faster and faster. So can the treatment time be reduced even further? Of course, if it can. We can do immediate restoration on implants placed in fresh extraction site. These uh, sites, this, uh, this systemic review shows us that there is an excellent implant prognosis on these cases. Again, you have to treatment plan correctly. You have to select your case correctly. But if you do insertion, post-extraction insertion, and immediate temporization, the prognosis is excellent. Systematic review. I'm not talking about two cases, five cases, or whatever. Systematic review. So it's evidence-based. And we used to do this all the time, taking out a tooth, an anterior tooth, placing the implant, mapping the site. Don't place any graft at that time. This is an old case. This is the way I used to do it. Placing the implant, not doing any buccal plate preservation, socket preservation, nothing. I wasn't using any grafting material at that time. Placing the temper in the afternoon, and then go to final in four to six months. It doesn't matter. The final result is excellent. I can't complain. Patient can't complain. So we're successful. We're not talking about, of course, success in terms of uh, function. We're not looking into function. We're looking, we know that we're successful in terms of function. We need to be successful in terms of aesthetic. What do we need to look at when we talk about aesthetic? All the scores that there are out there in the literature. The old one, the papilla height. This is not taken in consideration anymore that much because it's just considering that the papilla height, one millimeter, two millimeter, yes or no. It's most a yes or no score than a real score. The two most important scores that we have to take in consideration are the pink aesthetic score, considering the shape, the texture, the, the zenith of the uh, aesthetic, the, the pink tissues, the pink uh, area, compared to the contralateral side. The treated, non treated. And you're taking into consideration seven variables, giving a top of two points for each variable. So the top of the pink acid score is 14. And the thing we know is that improves with time. So if we, you're not happy with the pink acid score right away, you wait. That's why you always, in the aesthetic area, you always need a temporary, because you want to wait for the soft tissue to mature. I mean the creep uh, effect on the temporary. You have the you want the, the the time to condition the soft tissues, and then of course there is a prosthetic 
aesthetic score that is called the white aesthetic score, considering the crown itself, the shape, the color. But when you're talking about success, you have to always think about these two scores. And this is the case seven years later successful. If you look at the pink aesthetic score, white aesthetic score, perfect. I'm happy. Patient can complain. Patient is happy. He will refer me patients. For sure. Seven years, stable, easy, fast. Is this predictable? I don't think so. This is way too risky. Because we haven't taken any action but inserting the implant and we know the implant won't save us from resorption won't save us from losing the uh, root eminence appearance i was just lucky in this case but this is way too risky i wouldn't do a, a, a procedure like this in my practice anymore unless i plan on moving and going somewhere else in a few years i can do whatever who cares I've been working in Salerno for the last 20 years, so that's where I'm looking and working for the rest of my life. I don't want to play unsafe. I don't want to be risky. I'm playing with patients' smiles. And this is what I used to see when I was doing these cases. You know, taking out the tooth, inserting the implant, correct positioning, Inserting the final restoration, whenever, even immediately, the temporary and then the final in a few months. But look here. No root eminence appearance anymore. Look how flat this is. Definitely now we need to do something there. So if we haven't done any action before, or basically the only action we've taken was placing the implant, we know we can be successful in terms of uh, stability. So we said, with Dr. Bugnami, we said, okay, the buccal plate preservation works if we wait six weeks, works if we place the implant at the extraction time. Let's see if it works if we do place the uh, temporary right away, the provisional right away. And we call it immediate buccal plate preservation. We presented, we published this in 2013 in the Journal of Oral Implantology. We were seeing the same thing as we've seen so far. We had seen so far. Basically, we were maintaining the contour, the root eminence appearance. And this is the combing three months post-op. Look here. Xenograft on the buccal plate, xenograft at the collar. That's all what you need. The entire socket is full of bone. Because we haven't interfered with the self-healing potential of the socket. And of course, we have to do it more scientifically. So we published a case series in 2012 in the International Journal of Oral Maxillofacial Surgery. Ten cases. Immediate insertion, immediate uh, temporization, measurement at the uh, time zero, which is the placement of the implant when we were doing the buccal preservation. A measurement of three months when we were finishing the case. And look at the numbers. At the end of the case, we gain even more from the beginning because probably we this tissue became, as I told you, super connective and we're gaining even more. And we're stable. We know because a xenograph is stable. And this is what we do all the time now. We take out the tooth, look at the buccal plate, how thin the buccal plate is. In the anterior maxilla, I showed you, I know from the UBAD study that only 3% of my patients will have 2 millimeters of bone there. So if I take out the tooth and I place an implant here, I will lose the buccal plate, I will lose the root eminence appearance. So I take out the tooth, take the impression, putting the implant, taking the impression for the temporary, doing the buccal plate preservation technique, taking the CBCT right away, some bone at the collar, some bone outside on the buccal plate. In the afternoon, the patient will have her temporary placed, and then you wait. Of course, your temporary looks terrible, 
you want to leave the tissue not compressed. You don't want to squeeze the tissue there. You want to leave the tissue growing on your temporary, doing the creeping effect, and then push it up later, start conditioning the tissue. Of course, you have to play with the soft tissues. And this is the final result. Look at the contour. Very natural. The appearance is very natural. Fast, safe, predictable. Of course, this is stable. I know. I know even in the long term. I have cases at five, five seven, eight years now with the buccal plate preservation. And they're stable. This is an anterior case. Central incisor, mapping the site to make sure that my implant will be subcrestal once placed. Preparing the site. See, you have to be palatal in that comfort zone. Don't be in the danger zone. Comfort zone, palatally. Placing the implant. Now the pouch I'm doing after placing the implant. I mean, it doesn't really matter if you do before or after placing the implant. As long as when you play, place the xenograft, you place the cerebon and you place the xenograft, you want to have a healing abutment on your implant. Otherwise, the, you know, your xenograft goes into the hex of the, uh, of, the patient, of the implant. So you perform the small pouch, insert the cerebon there, and then preparing the temporary. You're preparing the temporary. You don't want a temporary that is with a, such a bombay. You want a flat temporary. You want a creeping effect on this temporary. You want a kind of slope in which the, on which the uh, tissue, the gums, can grow. This is at the same day in the afternoon. One week, look at here. We got even more convexity than the contralateral side. Six weeks. Now we start playing with the temporary, conditioning the soft tissue, pushing it up. I don't do any prosto, by the way. I have a prosthodontist. Uh, we work in a team. Of course, for these very demanding cases, most of the time you need a team, unless you're an excellent prosthodontist and an excellent surgeon together. I'm not. This is the final case. Look at the contour. And this is the CBCT at the end of the case. You have the buccal plate preserved by this amount of xenograft. Four years. Stable. Stable, even the soft tissue. Very natural. And of course, I take CBCT. I can't say that it's stable and the graft is still there if I don't show any CBCT in the long term. I have a four years follow up CBCT and even more for my patients. And the graft is still there. The buccal plate preservation, the graft on the buccal plate here, some of the color, and it's been four years. So I know it's stable. The graft will be there forever. Because I know that, you know. He maintains the volume in the long term. And we designed a prospective study that uh, will be submitted very soon. We treated 20 patients with immediate buccal plate preservation technique, and we were taking measurements at the time after insertion of the, the implant. And four years after, we were evaluating the changes of the buccal plate. We were taking two lines, we were drawing two lines, one uh, through the long axis of the implant and a perpendicular line to it. And then we were taking two parallel lines, one at the collar, one three millimeters from the first line on the collar, and measuring. And at four years, the mean loss at the implant collar was a tenth of a millimeter. Nothing. And apical to it, apical to it was... 0.15 millimeter of loss at four years. So this is definitely stable. So as a conclusion of the immediate placement and temporization plus the buccal plate, I can say that it doesn't interfere with the healing process because I'm doing everything outside the socket. Inside the socket, I'm placing the implant, and on the implant, I'm placing the temporary. And it works. 
So my technique, the buckle plate preservation, is easy. This technique might change the biotype. And I showed you is you have a long term stability. So from tomorrow, you might want to start thinking in a different way, looking at the socket in a different way, and look and say, hey, that thing heals by itself. Why I want to start placing something to slow down the healing, to have some connective tissue there, to don't have 100% bone into the socket? Let's place something outside the socket. What do you want is maintaining the contour, maintaining the root eminence appearance, being stable. So you want a serban, you want a xenograph, that it will maintain stability and will maintain the volume, but you don't want it into the socket. You want the material outside the socket. Let the socket heal by itself, even if you do place an implant. Don't place anything into the socket, but just outside the socket. And you'll be safe, easy, easy. Of course, there is a learning curve the first time First couple of times, you won't know where to place the, the graft and you get frustrated because the, the, the graft really doesn't go into the small pouch. But, you know, as every, every single procedure, there is a learning curve. But this procedure, it's easy, it's stable, and is an excellent, excellent, excellent tool for your patients. Thank you very much for your attention. Now I'll try to answer the questions if they come up. If I could read it, okay. There is a question about special, special uh, sutures. I think I answered uh, during the presentation. Uh, I usually use uh, figure eight uh, sutures as I showed you uh, in, the, uh, in one of the slides a nylon uh, suture, a synthetic suture, just to hold the, uh, the, 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 the graft into the socket. If I do place the temporary right after implant placement, I don't put any stitches, of course. OK, if I do the question, the other question, if I do you manage, if you have some uh, buckle plate resorption, the one of the uh, the things that you need in order to perform the buccal plate preservation is that all the four walls have to be intact. If there is a, some resorption, you might want to wait and do some GBR later. I mean, if you have the essence or fenestration, the technique I use the most is the ice cream cone technique, and it's probably the only time I do place something into the socket. But this is another topic. We can you know, do another webinar about that. Okay, if there is infection, of course, I usually don't do the immediate placement. There is a question, if you have an infection, how do you uh, how does it affect the buccal plate? How do you manage these cases? With big resorption and with big infection, you know, like a vertical fracture of the root, I don't do the buccal plate preservation. Uh, there is another question about the membrane. Which kind of membrane do you use? I don't use any membrane. As I mentioned, because I'm not doing a GBR procedure, I don't want, I don't look for a bone outside the socket. I don't really care. I want some super connected tissue, something stable. So I don't use any membrane. Okay, there is another question with thin biotype. Sometimes the cerebon might perforate the flap. Yes, sometimes it might. I haven't seen any major perforation, uh, especially on uh, on the uh, keratinized tissue. The only times I see some granules coming out is from the hole I make with the periodontal probe to map the site. I don't see any exfoliation of the uh, graft uh, itself. And even if it does, it will heal by secondary intention, but it will uneventfully. Uh, what happened with the apex of the implant? I don't know, refer to what? Uh, there is another question about uh, healing screw. If there is any danger of inflammation by putting the healing screw, 
Uh, usually not. I don't see any, uh, honestly, any inflammation. I usually place some uh, kind of temporary removable uh, provisional uh, on the site, uh, or more than a uh, removable, a fixed provisional uh, on the site. Um, and uh, so this will protect a little bit the COVID screw, but I haven't seen any major problem. Uh, do you suggest a xenograft? Yes, I do. As I mentioned, uh, I'm using the Cerebon uh, now. And you don't need this, uh, that much of, uh, of a grafting material. With a small vial, you'll be able to do the procedure. There is another question if I ever tried, or do you consider to do any connected tissue graft? during the immediate placement combined with the buccal plate preservation. You do not need to do any connected tissue graft combined to the buccal plate because by doing, by placing the xenograft outside the socket, you get some super connected tissue. So basically you're getting like a sort of connected tissue graft by placing the xenograft because you're not getting bone most likely. I don't know, we haven't done any histology. You can't do histology in these cases, it's impossible. I have histology on other cases where I place the the, um, the xenograft without doing without looking for a GBR, and I've seen that there is super connected tissue. So probably that's why I don't do any connected tissue graft because I get connected tissue outside the the socket. There is a question, uh, if it makes any sense to crush or to make the particles of the bone even smaller, and then it's very hard in order to prevent any uh, damage to the soft tissue. I think then uh, if you make the, the particles smaller, you have problems in handling and in squeezing into the small pouch because the pouch is very small. You know, you do the pouch mesiodistally, at the apex of the, 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 at the peaks of the bone. So it's a very small pouch. If, if you crash it, it might get impossible. You might, it is, it might be impossible to handle and to squeeze into the pouch you created. Uh, would you recommend a strum on SLA active? Uh, yeah, I mean, act, yeah, the uh, SLA active surface is perfect for uh, uh, immediate placement with BPP, but, you know, I use Strauman, so I would tell you, yes, I do. I suggest <laughs> the SLA active surface. I mean, if you have to choose between SLA active on, or rock solid or S, uh, SLA, I think SL active, you use it in those cases when you need to be even faster, you know, when you're doing a, a final restoration uh, in eight weeks, 10 weeks. Uh, otherwise, you can use SLA regularly. Of course, I use BLT, I use tapered implants now. Uh, PRF. Yeah, I mean, as I told you, there are different uh, ridge preservations technique, and if you're familiar with the PRF and you have nice results, fine. I don't know if you perform the, uh, uh, the socket preservation with PRF without placing the implant or with placing the implant, but with this technique, you can choose. You can place the implant, you can place the implant at six weeks, and you can place the implant and having the temporary. So won't change your approach. You don't need to change anything in your practice. If you wait six weeks, by doing the buccal plate preservation technique, you can still wait six weeks and go in. If you put the implants usually right away into the socket, you can do the buccal plate and place the implant right away. If you do place the implant and the temporary at the same time, you can still do it because the buccal plate preservation uh, will work. Uh, what kind of uh, temporary are you using? I try not to use cement on the temporary. But if I have to, I use cement. I watch for the cement uh, to not go into the healing site. But 
as I told you, I don't cement the crown, the temporary. The prosthodontist does it, but we usually try to do uh, screw retained. Okay, there are some thanks, some appreciation. I really thank everybody to listening to. Okay, if you don't have a primary stability, as I told you, this technique gives you the opportunity to don't change your your way of practicing. I mean, you can wait, see, you, you go in, you take out the tooth, you wait for six weeks. But since you want to go in and you don't want to lose any buckle plate, just perform the buckle plate preservation when you take out the tooth and then wait six weeks and go in. Or you can even wait four months. I haven't put the slides where I go in after six, eight months after performing the buckle plate preservation technique and the, the, the xenograft is still there. In the first case, there is some, yeah, I know sometimes there is the uh, scattering of the CBCT and they look like you're losing uh, uh, some bone at the apex because the question is, in, in a case, I've seen some resorption at the apex of the implant. But if you get so much of resorption the, uh, at the apex of the implant that you've seen in the CBCT, you will, you will see the apex of the implant through the soft tissue. Unfortunately, it's the scattering of the... CBCT giving you the impression that you're getting some resorption. Uh, can you talk about the implant placement, the idea on uh, implant placement? We talk about that. We, uh, I suggest you to read the uh, Boozer uh, article in, um, published in 2004 about the comfort and the danger zone. The, the GD article from 2008 and the uh, uh, the Tarnow article from 2002, and all those are excellent to bring, to lead you to uh, uh, the correct presentation, the correct uh, positioning of the implant. I do use the small uh, what graft particle diameter do you use? The smallest available, and the company, the company you use the Cerebon, they have uh, 0.5. Uh, I mean the the smallest one they have. The socket uh, shield technique is probably one of those that I've never done in my life. So I know that it works. I know that uh, uh, people uh, go around and showing nice cases has been published. So I believe it works, but it's probably one of the fewest things I haven't tried in my practice. So I can't really answer. And I. It looks like it works. I don't know if in my hands it will. But I feel more comfortable and safer in performing a buccal plate preservation technique. Yes, I do. Uh, do you put the graft only coronal? Yes, I don't need to go deep into the socket because that will heal by itself. I mean, of course, if I place coronal, I'm sure some granules will go, will end up more apical than just at the uh, collar of the implant, but I'm not looking to squeeze any grafting material into the gap. Uh, would I use allograft? I don't see the need to. I mean, xenograft works perfectly and uh, perfectly, and uh, so far I haven't had any problems, so I don't see why changing. Are you always having a stable result during immediate implant placement? A stable results in terms of aesthetic with the buccal plate preservation technique? Uh, yes, I usually do. I mean, it's very rare that I get so much resorption that even the buccal plate preservation can counteract it. The question, uh, good question, thanks for asking. Do you place the cerebon under the periosteum? 
Yes, I do. I mean, the pouch is creating in between the buccal plate, the external part of the buccal plate and the periosteum. So basically you're underneath the periosteum with your small elevator and above the buccal plate. So it's a pouch between the, uh, the periosteum and the buccal plate. The other question is what eventually will happen to the graft placed? What happens is, as I told you, that probably it will never become bone. Sometimes, as I showed you, you might see bone, but that's, you know, I guess it's quite rare. And I think, and I know what happens most likely is that you get a super connected tissue. Those granules will get englobated into some kind of connected tissue or some kind of bone or steroid tissue or whatever. I just want to thank all the compliments I'm seeing here. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks, thanks. What kind of implants do you use more in the aesthetic area, in the aesthetic zona, zone? I use tapering implants. And now I definitely think that uh, Straman has a great answer uh, for these cases since they came out with the uh, BLT, the uh, bone level tapered implant. Those works, those work are just fine, perfect for these aesthetic cases. The question is, uh, BPP successful only for anteriors? Uh, no, when we started, we didn't start with the anteriors, of course. We were testing the procedure, so we started with, the, with molars, but, you know, I didn't have much time, enough time to go over all the process you know we started with posterior we were comparing two sides one next to each other with the without buccal plate so we didn't go ahead and do just the uh, uh, and then the anterior uh, central incisor when you start driving when you get your license you don't go on a ferrari and start going 300 kilometers per hour you start with a small car you in mercedes then porsche and then you go on a ferrari but and this is the same. I mean, we started from posterior sites and then we moved to the anterior sites. But it does work for posterior, of course. It works anywhere. The other question, again, the, about the uh, loss of the top of the uh, alveolus, there is just a scattering of the CBCT because if you lose, if I had lost much I would see the tip of the implant coming through the soft tissue so and I think uh, there are no more questions uh, anymore so I wanna oh here another one there was another one you cut it off okay okay the question is uh, about the um, membrane again Simi Silver is asking me why you don't want to use a membrane because placing a membrane in a, such a small pouch is almost impossible. You will need a hard, very hard and stiff membrane. And then again, you're not looking for a, 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 a regenerative procedure. You don't, want, you don't need bone there because you don't need to place, you're not placing the implant outside the buccal plate. You just want something stable. That's why you want a xenograft. And you want something, a kind of tissue that stay there, stays there. So you don't really need a, a, a GBR. You you want to do something simple, and you know, and predictable. You you don't need a membrane. Basically, I'm not doing a GBR. I'm not recreating. I'm not creating any bone. I'm not doing a GBR. That's why I'm not using a membrane. And there is another question um, about uh, the socket shield that I think I answered before, and uh, as I, I repeat it. Uh, I never used, uh, it's probably one of the surgical procedures I've never done in my life, the socket shield, but it does work. I think I've seen the literature, I see people presenting, and it looks like it works. Uh, there is another question about the graft. If I'm mixing uh, mixing it with uh, with autogenous bond, no, I'm not because I don't want anything that it gets resorbed. I just want the xenograft that stays there. Alloplastic. 
but uh, the, what about the alloplastic bone instead of uh, xenograft? Whatever, whatever stays stable in the long term, it will work. But I think xenograft is the best material for this kind of technique because it get in, gets englobated. You have, it has blood cells passing through, attaching to the graft. Then the osteoblast will attach. So you will have a mix of different kind of tissue. And in my hands, it works just excellent. Do you place, again, there is another question about the, placing the graft into the gap. I place the graft just at the collar, as I said, and I'm sure, you know, by putting the, impl the, the, the graft at the collar, some can get down to the gap a little bit, but I'm not looking for, I don't look for placement of the graft into the gap. I just place the graft at the collar, holding the soft tissue and outside the socket, as I said. And I think I don't see any questions uh, anymore. So I want to, here we go. As I said, uh, I did it. Okay. So I want to thank everybody again. It was a pleasure. And uh, I see that uh, there is some interest there. And you can write me anytime on my email. You can get it through the uh, Bodies Academy. And uh, we can uh, discuss and change ideas. I'm always open and willing to learn. Uh, because you don't learn when you speak, but you learn when you listen. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Kayatso, for sharing your lecture and your insightful information with us. We would also like to thank BOTIS for making this online course possible and thank you, our wonderful audience, for your interest and participation. The CE quiz is now available online on the course page and completing it will allow you to earn your ADA SERP CE credits. The recording will be posted online within the next 48 hours. You will receive an email notification with a link to the recording. Further questions for Dr. Kayatso may be submitted directly on the website on the courses page under the Ask the Expert tab. So please go ahead and submit your questions and Dr. Kayatso will be sure to get back to you as soon as possible. Please be sure to visit the BOTIS educational platform www.botisacademy.com and keep an eye out for our growing schedule of online courses. Thank you again to all, take care and goodbye.